Hey everybody, this is my thoughts on Isonzo. This is the third game in the World War I series that started with Verdun and was followed up by Tannenberg. And now we have Isonzo, also made by the same developers, M2H and Black Milk Games. And since it was released last week, I've put a few hours into it and wanted to go ahead and make a video on it. Thing is that I'm not sure how much longer I'm actually going to play Isonzo precisely because of what I will talk about during this video. You see, Isonzo takes place in the Isonzo front of World War I, which is a much lesser known part of the war. It was one of the more brutal fronts of the war, fought between primarily the Italians and the Austro-Hungarians, although eventually the Germans did reinforce the Austro-Hungarians. And while it was almost continuous fighting for the almost two and a half years that that front lasted, historians have more or less split it into 12 specific battles of the Isonzo River, culminating in the Battle of Caporetto. This was mountain warfare, which is a special kind of hell. In addition to the terrain simply being extremely difficult to navigate even at the best of times, there was also the threat of avalanches burying troops. There was the additional shrapnel of all the rock in the mountains being thrown up whenever an artillery strike hit, thus causing even more damage than it would have done on any other front. And if you thought making any kind of offensive gains in the western and eastern fronts was horrible, then imagine being on the Isonzo front, where the terrain was so difficult to navigate and was so easy to defend that even single marksmen could hold off entire areas by themselves, let alone groups of them with machine guns and artillery support and so on and so forth. And by the end of the Isonzo campaign, the estimated casualties were over a million across both sides with the majority of them being Italians, because the Italian commander Luigi Cadorna thought the best way of attacking this was to just keep throwing his troops at them in a frontal assault over and over and over again until eventually they'd break through, which they never did. The phrase, did I ever tell you the definition of insanity, comes to mind, but anyway. That's what we're dealing with as far as the battlefields of Isonzo the game. And while it's great to see that a much lesser known aspect of World War I is being covered in a video game, the real question here is, how is the game itself? Is it an improvement over Verdun and Tannenberg? Did they try something substantially different? What exactly are we dealing with here? Well, I will say that in terms of visuals, and in terms of animations, they've definitely done a much better job than for Dunn and Tannenberg. It looks a lot better, they've got better textures, better modeling, the animations are much smoother, although they're still a bit clunky, and they're running on a somewhat updated version of the Unity engine, so the capabilities of the engine are certainly improved compared to what we've seen from the previous two games. So while it certainly doesn't look like a modern AAA game, Isonzo actually looks pretty decent. It certainly looks a lot better than its predecessors, which really didn't look very good when they came out. So they've certainly improved the visuals quite a lot. What about the rest of the presentation? Well, the sound design didn't really improve all that much. They've got a decent soundtrack, and the voice acting is certainly acceptable. I mean, you've got the Italian speaking Italian, you've got the Austro-Hungarian speaking German, and it all sounds fine. And then there's the gun and explosion sounds. Now, the explosion sounds are actually okay, but the gun sounds are absolutely pathetic, which is not all that surprising, given that they were also pretty pathetic in both Verdun and Tannenberg. But it's still extremely disappointing that they still haven't improved that going into Isonzo. I mean, these are games where you go down in basically one or two shots. These guns should sound pretty beefy, and instead, not only do they sound weaker than the pistols in most other games, but I've actually heard more powerful sounding air guns in real life. That is just pathetic. Look, I know this is probably kind of petty to focus on, but I am so damn tired of first-person shooters and third-person shooters having wimpy gun sound effects. They are your primary method of interacting with the game. They need to sound good. Anyway, presentation aside, what about the game itself? Well, they did change up the game mode in this compared to its predecessors. You now have a sector-based offensive mode where one team is on offense, the other team is on defense, and the attacking team has a limited number of reinforcements. They need to complete their objectives before their reinforcements run out. If they manage to complete all of the objectives in a given sector, then it moves on to the next sector and the reinforcement count replenishes up to maximum. These objectives vary a bit depending on which map you're playing on, but you're mostly going to be either demolishing an objective 
or capturing an objective by just holding that position until eventually you manage to overrun the enemy. That's all pretty straightforward. The tricky part is actually achieving these objectives. You see, if you're the offense, not only do you have to worry about the reinforcements going down, you also have to worry about the fact that nearly all of the maps are heavily stacked against the offensive team. Not only do the defenders get infinite respawns, but they are in advantageous positions right from the beginning, and they tend to have a lot of cover, which the offensive team does not. And of course, there are plenty of emplaced machine guns, among other things, so it is very easy for the defenders to hold a position down. This, of course, doesn't mean it's impossible for the offensive team to win, but they are at a distinct disadvantage, so they require a lot more teamwork than the defenders do to achieve victory. Obviously, that doesn't mean that the defenders can just ignore teamwork entirely. They do need to work together as a team to achieve victory as well. It's just that their more advantageous position on the most of the maps tends to compensate for some of their inefficiencies. So how is teamwork in Isanzo achieved? Well, you have multiple different classes that you can play as. There's the basic rifleman who just runs around with a rifle and you can have infinite numbers of those on your team. There's the engineer which can construct various field defenses like throwing down some sandbags or barbed wire as well as throw down mortars. There's the assault class which gains access to grenades. There's the sharpshooter which is mainly centered around engaging enemies at long range and has access to scoped rifles. The mountaineer which is a scout class that allows them to spot enemies and weapon emplacements and such like that whether it be using binoculars or by using a flare, and if they use the flare, then the area that they have lit up with that flare gets a bonus to mortar accuracy from your team, so they also can facilitate that. And then there is the officer class, which runs around with pistols and can call in artillery strikes as well as gas attacks, and can initiate charges, which will eliminate the spawn timer for a brief period. And obviously you need multiple players in all these different roles in order for your team to be able to work together and achieve victory. There are, however, some really nasty problems with this. The first of them is a problem that plagues any game that is oriented around very heavy team play, and that is communication. Despite this game actually having voice chat, it doesn't seem like anybody actually uses it. In the entire time I played it, there was nobody actually using the voice chat. At absolute best, they were using text chat, and most of the time they weren't even using that. Obviously, if your team is not communicating, then you really can't work together all that well. But again, this is a problem that plagues any game that has a heavy emphasis on team play, whether it's stuff like Verdun, Tannenberg, and Isanzo, or even other stuff like like Arma or Squad or Beyond the Wire, Hell Let Loose, so on and so forth. That in and of itself is going to make the experience of trying to play Isonzo extremely subjective. If you happen to get in matches where people are actually communicating and communicating well, then you're going to have a hell of a better time than somebody like me who goes into these matches, finds absolutely nobody communicating, and either just gets completely curb stomped because the enemy team was actually communicating, or if the enemy team isn't communicating, then you just curb stomp them. It just gets incredibly frustrating. This was a problem in Verdun and Tannenberg, and it is still a problem in Isanzo, and it is a problem in any game that is similar to this in terms of requiring heavy teamwork. But then there are the problems with Isanzo specifically. The first of them is something that was a problem in both Verdun and Tannenberg as well, and it's just a constant source of frustration. The idea that you constantly die and have absolutely no idea where the shot came from. On the one hand, that's pretty realistic for World War I. Death was around every corner. On the other hand, this is a video game. It is not real life and constantly dying in a video game and having no idea where the shot came from so you can't figure out a way to get around it is not fun. And the especially weird part is, it seems like this is only really a problem with Isanzo, Verdun, and Tannenberg. I've never really run into this problem with other games in this similar vein, like, say, Squad or Hell Let Loose or anything like that. Normally in games like this, you can at least tell the general direction that the shot came from, but in Verdun, Tannenberg, and Isanzo, you really can't a lot of the time. 
I mean, sure, in a more realistic game like this, I'm not expecting some big indicator to pop up on the screen whenever I'm being shot at, but at the very least, the audio should be able to help clue you in on that, and it really doesn't. And the thing is, it's not just with gunshots that you have this problem, it's also with grenades. You'll hear them landing around you, but you don't know where they're actually landing, so you just have to pick a direction and start running and hope that you can get far away enough from the grenade before it goes off. And, spoiler alert, you're probably not going to be able to get away from it. I mean, at least with artillery barrages and mortars and such, you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and there's not really anything you can do about it, so while it's annoying, it's not the constant source of frustration that being shot or blasted to smithereens by grenades is. But even once you discount the constant dying out of nowhere problem, there's also the massive changes they made to the progression system and the way the classes and squads work. You see, in Verdun and Tannenberg, you had squads set up where one member of the squad was some sort of officer, and then everybody else fulfilled different infantry roles, and everybody had access to a wide variety of equipment that could be unlocked by spending unlock points that you would just earn by playing the game. In Isanzo, that weapon and equipment progression has been completely replaced by level grind and challenge-based unlocks like you would see in modern Call of Duty games. Because you know what sounds like a great idea? Hiding the thing that a given class is supposed to do behind challenge-based unlocks. Like, say, I don't know, the Assault class, whose main thing is being able to throw grenades at enemies, needing to unlock said grenades by getting bayonet kills. Because that makes sense. I mean, at least with, say, the Mountaineer unlocking the flare gun, all you have to do is spot things using the binoculars that your class starts with, so there's that. But you basically end up in the same exact position that games like, say, the Battlefield series have ended up with, where you can't fulfill the obligations of your class until you have ground out some levels in that class. If it were only cosmetic unlocks that were locked behind level grinding and challenge grinding, then that'd be fine. But since it is equipment that you actually need to be able to perform the obligations of your class more effectively, it's just a downright asinine way of handling the progression. I mean, at least with the weapon unlocks, those are usually more side grades than anything else, but even then, Verdun and Tannenberg had a much better system for handling the weapon unlocks. You had unlock points. You spend them on the weapon that you actually want to use, instead of just having to grind out levels in the class and then complete an arbitrary challenge to be able to unlock that weapon. It certainly wasn't a perfect system, but they could have improved it with this, and instead they just chucked it in the bin and went with something that is considerably worse. But by far the worst change that was made to Isonzo, and the one that frankly ruins the game, is the change to the way the classes work. See, in Verdun and Tannenberg, you had your squads, you had an officer within your squad, and they helped to direct things. In Isonzo, you get a grand total of two officers for your entire team. You get seven engineers and mountaineers for your entire team, five assault troops for your entire team, and four marksmen for your entire team. Everyone else has to be a rifleman. And if the people who have chosen to be in these various roles, especially with, say, the officer, are not very good at those particular classes, well, too bad, you're stuck with them. And they even go a step further with this. The marksman class, which you can have a grand total of four on your team, by the way, gets exactly one slot for scoped rifles. You get one scoped rifle for the entire team. And if that person using that scoped rifle isn't very good with it, well, too bad, they're the only one who gets to have it. All of the other marksmen are stuck with the same terrible iron sights that all of the other infantry get. I mean, sure, that's period accurate. Iron sights on rifles from that era were downright terrible for the most part. But you would at least think that the marksman class, centered around long-range precision shots, of which you can have four on your team, would all be able to equip scoped rifles. But nope, only one of them gets to have it for no discernible reason. I mean, if you're gonna put four marksman slots in the game and only one of them gets a scoped rifle, you might as well only make it one marksman slot. And to make matters worse, because they have made all of these classes split across the entire team as opposed to being in individual squads, with each individual squad being a specific unit that has its own capabilities, they 
basically made the squad play absolutely pointless. Because now the only point to the squad system is having mobile spawn points. You can spawn on your squad mates, but even then you don't actually spawn on your squad mates, you just spawn near them. And that's something else that is infuriating about this game, is the spawn system. I didn't really think that they'd be able to outdo Call of Duty on having a terrible spawn system, but somehow they managed to do it. I mean, after all, at least when you spawn in Call of Duty, it might spawn you right on top of an enemy, but at least it doesn't spawn you stuck in a wall. In Isanzo, not only can you spawn and die before you even get control of your character because you just happened to be spawning right in front of an enemy that was shooting, not only can you spawn right on top of enemies and just die almost immediately, but on a surprisingly frequent basis, you will just spawn stuck in a wall or stuck in a rock or something like that. Sometimes you might actually get lucky and be able to wiggle your way out of it, but most of the time you're not going to be able to and you just have to go back into the menu, click on redeploy, and then just sit there waiting another 20 plus seconds to respawn. And to make matters worse, that is frustrating enough if you're on defense. It's even worse if you're on offense because you have limited respawns as the offense. So I don't know what the hell's wrong with their spawn system, but they need to fix that pronto. Then of course there's the matter of the weapon sway. You see, when you aim down your sights in Verdun and Tannenberg, it's like most other games where you aim down your sights. It's just put in the middle of the screen and you might have to deal with projectile drop, but other than that, it's a pretty straightforward process. In Isanzo, not only do you need to deal with projectile drop like you did in the previous games, but you now also need to deal with weapon sway, which is something they introduced in Isanzo and dialed up way too much because the weapon sway is kind of insane. You'll go to aim down your sights and because the weapon sway just arbitrarily chooses how it wants to behave, you might be completely on target, you might be wildly off target and have to readjust, and in the time that it took you to readjust, you're probably already dead. You can hold your breath to reduce the weapon sway, but it actually doesn't stop even if you are holding your breath. It just reduces the weapon sway, so you're still gonna have to deal with it. You're still gonna be off target a lot of the time, and it's gonna result in numerous instances of saying things like, what the hell game, I had that shot, why did you rob it from me? Is it an insurmountable problem? Of course not. You can work around it to some degree but it's an added frustration on top of a bunch of other added frustrations that weren't as frustrating in the previous games, and what you end up with here is an experience that is weirdly more polished than both Verdun and Tannenberg, but also noticeably less enjoyable. And since it's noticeably less enjoyable on a fundamental level compared to its predecessors, it means that subjective experience of getting into a match with a team that is actually working together really well and is communicating is going to be absolutely paramount. And in the experience I've had with Asanzo thus far, which is several hours of gameplay, that hasn't been the case. It's just been mostly silent, maybe some occasional text chat, no voice chat at all. And between that and how they've gutted the squad slash class system and how they've made such baffling decisions with what you can equip, when you can equip it, and how you unlock it in the first place, it just makes me not really want to play Isanzo anymore. They did post a roadmap showing what they've got planned for additional content and updates later on down the line, so maybe I'll take a look at it again after it's had some updates, but as it stands right now, I really can't recommend it unless you are an absolute diehard fan of Verdun and Tannenberg and just want to keep supporting the developer. As for me though, I think I'm pretty much done with Isanzo for now. I might come back to it later after it's had a few content updates and see if they've improved things, but as it is now, I'm really just not having much fun with it at all. Thank you all very much for watching. If you like my videos, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon. All the revenue from that goes directly back into the channel, whether it be getting more equipment or replacing broken equipment or getting more games for review or whatever the case may be. If you can't afford to or don't want to, that's perfectly fine. I understand. But the option's there if you're interested. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all in later videos.